Hi, so um, first a bit about myself. So uh, I have two sides. One is an entrepreneur and CEO. And my other side during the nights, I really enjoy participating in, in deep learning competitions. And this has been recently going on since uh, 2017. And typically, I spend my time in a place called Kaggle, which is a, a, a website where uh, people from all over the world compete. Um, so typically, companies have a problem, and they want to crowdsource, if you will, the solution to different teams from different pers perspectives. And this has been really gaining momentum in the past few years. So you can see I got really excited when I was uh, browsing through Twitter, and then I saw this guy who I follow. Uh, so he's a Chinese guy who happens to be doing his uh, PhD um, in the US. And then he said something along the lines of, hey, you know, so this is what he said. The way I read it was, OK, so you, know, you guys do these fancy competitions in the West, in Kaggle, but in China, you know, we have these places, right? So he um, lists you know, different websites, which I had no idea that existed. Then I went into one of these websites, and actually I went to a few of them, and they were really, really, really uh, challenging problems. So in China, there's a whole world of deep learning and deep learning competitions that we, at least in, in, in the West, I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about them. So I went to one of these places, and of course I see this. Okay, so everything is in Chinese, but then I hit translate. I don't speak Chinese, and then I get, you know, the sense that this is a a competition about LiDAR, um, you know, and it sounded, you know, pretty decent. So, um, you know, I, I decided to join. Uh, so I, I kind of find the, the join uh, button in this place. And then, you know, the registration said basically, you know, in China, everything happens uh, on the internet. You have to have a, a cell phone. So in China, it's really mobile first. So the authentication required you to have um, um, a Chinese mobile phone, uh, phone number, which I didn't have. So, you know, I was a bit frustrated, but I am a persistent person. So I, I write, um, you know, I send this email to the organization and say, hey, you know, hey, guys, you know, I really like to join this competition. Uh, can I join? And, you know, no response, all right? No response. So I got a bit frustrated. Then I, then I read um, also on the MIT Technology Review that, you know, China has this great master plan to become, you know, an AI powerhouse in 2030. Uh, and they said, you know, we are, be, uh, we are a bit isolated, you know, we really want to be more collaborative with the world, etc. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, how hypocrites these guys, you know, who, you know, they are like, you know, boasting about that they are going to be open and I cannot join the competition. So I write again, right? I write again, no response in the first email. I write again, hey guys, it's me again. The guy from Spain, um, I really want to join this competition. No response. Then I got really frustrated, and I you know, almost, almost went to tweet you know, the, the Chinese prime minister. Uh, you know, what the fuck is going on, guys, with your openness, collaboration, deep learning? I cannot join. And I'm thinking, OK, you know, Andres, hold on, because if you ever want to go to China, you know, if you do this, you may not, you know, be able to come back. <laughs> and I may be sent to a, like a reeducation camp or something. I don't know. So um, then I go back. I, I, you know, I composed a tweet, etc. I was about to tweet it. But then I go to the website again. And oh my god, they added Spain. <laughs> so there's like China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Spain. Hopefully, we don't become a province of China. Uh, <laughs> So I joined, and um, you know, I joined. And then, uh, you know, when you join these competitions, you have to pick up a name for your team. And I have this, fr this friend. So I live in Alicante. I have this friend from Madrid. So I'm not from Madrid. I have no idea about almost anything in Madrid. And he tells me like he lives in a, a neighborhood called San Chinarro. And I'm thinking to myself, these guys in Madrid are crazy. Do they have also like a San? Koreanarro or San Japonesarro too. So you know, for you English guys, San Chinaro could be almost translated as like a saint, you know, and Chinese and big Chinese guy. Right? So I'm thinking, see, so this is what I saw. San Chinaro. So, you know, so this really is sticking in my head. I don't know why. So 
I was like whole day thinking about Santinarro, Santinarro, and then I joined this competition, and then I put a, you know, that in my in my name. Now, did did I know that eventually we were going to win? So, you know, obviously I got asked, right? Like, you know, the Chinese guys really wanted to know what Santinarro meant, right? So it was very difficult to explain. So I, what I did is. Uh, you know, this is uh, San, you know, for us, San is like a saint, right? So there's the, the in China, you know, in the, same way, in the same way as in the West, we have Aristotle, you know, the, from the Greeks. So they have Confucius, right, which is a very wise person. So they have a pronoun to name, you know, wise people, right? So I said, you know, these first two characters are like the equivalent of wise person, right? And chinarro, right, Ch china in Spanish could also mean stone by a long stretch. Um, and then the other part is, you know, do you, do you know this stone, which is a precious stone, green jade stone? So, so I tell the guys, like, San Chinarro means wise jade stone. And then the guy said, oh, my God. <laughs> so that's just for the name. Um, so the, actually, I, I competed, so this is kind of my bio, and I, I joined this competition with uh, a friend of mine who I've never met, so I've met this guy uh, with Kaggle in competitions. Uh, so, you know, we embarked in this uh, challenge. So now, going back again to the competition, what this is really about is to they give you um, a LiDAR point, a, a, what is called a point cloud. If you see self-driving cars, they have this device uh, on top of them, except for Tesla, which for, uh, for uh, cost uh, reasons, they cannot add a LiDAR. Um, almost all of the others, especially um, self-driving uh, fleets like taxis, they do have, like Uber has this, you know, ugly thing on top, um, Waymo has two, et cetera. So everybody uses LiDAR. There's many reasons why you want to use LiDAR. Um, essentially, it works during the night, so the way in which it works is it has you know, multiple beams of lasers that go um, and then um, do like a cycle, like a, a tur they, they, they turn very quickly. And then um, they project um, a laser beam, it reflects and they measure two things. They measure distance and, and, and they also measure the amount of intensity. So they are, they are not able to see colors, they are actually in infrared, but you know, the different reflections, different materials have different reflections. So this is, so um, the, also the good way in which um, a good characteristic of LiDAR is that, of course, because if emissive, it's not reflective um, in the sense that we, know we, don't, we do not depend on the sun, it works during the night. And also give you a natively 3D representation of points. So what I'm showing in, the, um, in, the, uh, in this video is like the top view of the LiDAR, but in reality, you have like a 3D points. You have the X, Y, and Z coordinates of each and every point that you get. Plus, so you have the position and the intensity. Um, that's what you have. So this competition is really, there's only, I don't speak Chinese, but hopefully there are formulas which are universal. So they ask you to uh, classify each and every point. So this is for you, for those of you who know about deep learning, this is called a segmentation problem. Um, so for every point, they ask you to classify them in one of seven categories, like pedestrians, cars, motorcycles, crowds, you know, vans, etc. Seven categories, um, and then they they um, rank you uh, with an objective score. So this is what I really like about competitions: is not you know how elegant the solution is, you know, based on some sort of subjective uh, um, judge. This is like a metric, and if you do well, then you win. That's it. Um, then the other, obviously Alibaba uh, is interested in this for uh, commercial reasons, so in this competition, so you have to get, you know, as, uh, as, you know, the best you can get with this score, plus you need to be able to process this thing in real time. And by real time, they mean you have to process each frame, each cycle of the LiDAR in, um, in a less than uh, 100 milliseconds with uh, you know, 1080 GPU and, and this i7 CPU. So that's what they ask you. And uh, also the training data that they give you is heavily unbalanced. What this means is that you may have lots of, let's say, um, uh, actually the, the most uh, abundant class is 
really the floor and, and nothing, like, you know, just the environment. And then there's uh, less abundant classes like, uh, like uh, Vans, for example, that was less abundant. In China, there's lots of model cycles, uh, but they're, they're heavy, heavily in balance, which, you know, has some challenges for deep learning. So, um, so that's what we are asked to do. Now, the first thing, if you've ever um, faced um, you know, deep learning problem, the first, or even a machine learning problem, uh, even more than a deep learning one, is to know, you know what type of inputs you get. Now, now, here the challenge is that the LiDAR um, you know, is this, right? This, well, actually, it's not this. So this is a 2D projection. So we are projecting a 3D uh, point cloud in 2D and from, from, you know, from the outside. Now, the beauty with LiDAR is that you can project in 2D in many different ways, right? So this is kind of a perspective from the outside. You could also project it, uh, you know, as you were seeing it from the sensor. You can project it from the top. You can project it from the side. Okay, but the important thing is that each LiDAR frame, a frame means like a cycle of the, of the lasers, um, has about seven, you know, five, um, 57,000 points per frame. Um, so each point is a reflection. Now, something that is challenging is that if you are seeing this, and if you've ever faced a deep learning problem, so the first issue is that, so this is really the native format of LiDAR is just they give you points, x, y, c coordinates plus the intensity, right? So, and then there is every frame has a different number of points. So not every frame has um, 57,000. Some frames have more points, other frames have less points. So now you, you can see this, this is different. Also, the order of the points doesn't really matter, right? In an image, uh, if you think about an image, the, the order of the pixels in an image is really important, right? Because if you shuffle the pixels, you get coverage. Um, in this case, because you're given an X, Y, and Z coordinate, uh, that's what really defines the actual order, right? Is the, is the position is encoded in the, in, the, in the point itself. So the order in which you're given this sequence, um, it's irrelevant. In, the, in that sense, it's not really a sequence. It's really a set, right? A set of points that you're given. So that's a first issue. So, okay, how do we deal with LiDAR point clouds? Um, you know, in, in these competitions, not, not, of course, not only in China, but here also in, in Kaggle, um, to win these competitions or even to score in the you know, one, top 1%, one you need to do two things. You need to do, the first one is obvious, but it's difficult, is to do everything right. So whatever you do, you have to do it right. There's no room for mistakes in any of these competitions. And the second thing, if you really, really want to be on top, by top I mean top 10, you have to do something different. So now this is challenging, right? You have to do everything right and it has to be different. So um, when I embark on these kind of challenges, I always try to um, approach using my weaknesses as a strengths and say, okay, what is everybody else doing? What is the state of the art in LiDAR recognition? So in state of the art, essentially, if you score through patents and through publications, you will see that what people do is um, they, they take the point cloud and build projections from the top, from the side. So they build images, right? That's an image with projections. So that's, um, and then, of course, because um, in deep learning, I would say that image recognition is really the most advanced uh, um, application of deep learning. You know, image classification is very mature. Uh, image segmentation is also very mature. So if you are able to move your problem from a 3D point set, which is difficult, um, to an image problem, then you, know, you're, you're, you, know, you are getting closer to something workable, at least. But you know, I said, OK, I cannot do the same as other people who've been working on this problem for years are going to do, because you know, they're going to uh, really beat me on this issue. So um, OK, so that's easy. So I started like, exploring what is really, really um, the sensor uh, computing. And if you think about what the sensor does, so this is kind of how it works. So there is like, a, in, in this case, there's uh, 32. Um, lasers, so one laser is, is fixed, like pointing in this angle, the next one is pointing in this, so with, with fixed lasers that it's, they're spinning, 
right? They're spinning. Uh, they're able to capture the environment. So um, the estimate is, is going, you know, from, uh, you know, there's a full cycle. So from 0 to 360 or from minus 180 to 180. So it, you know, goes in this angle. And then there's one laser for each um, cinnate angle, for each, like, you know, the, the kind of the elevation angle. So that's how it works. If we take the a frame, and in this competition we were given frames as a CSV file. So each line of the of, of a frame has like a th the three coordinates, S, Y, and Z in meters, and then intensity. So if we convert the X, Y, and Z coordinates into polar coordinates in 3D, so you have distance and two angles, and we plot the uh, the azimuth angle. Um, of, of course, you know, it's, you know, it's something we expect, right? It's spinning, so it's going, in this case, it goes from, uh, from zero, and then it goes all the way down to minus 180. Then it, you know, it, it flips, goes to 180, and goes back, what you really would expect. Now, you will see that sometimes it goes to zero. So you see that is, is a weird thing that, that it's, for the most part, is linear, but sometimes it goes to zero. So, you know, but, but we'll see what's going on later. The important thing is that at least we are, it looks that we are given the data ordered in the same way in which the sensor captured the data. So that's what really is of interest to us at this point. So um, if we plot, so this is the, if we plot for the, the, the just the asimut angle, right, in the same order as it's being read from the sensor, and if we plot it, into a, let's say an image, like a, in, if we plug into a matrix. So each line, each, each horizontal line is one laser. So the laser, let's say that points to the sky is the top um, line and the sensor that points to the, to the floor is the bottom line. Then, and then we plot in color the asimut angle. So it, you see that it goes from some purplish uh, color it goes to dark blue, and then it goes to yellow, which is 180, and then it goes back to the same color. So it's, it's, this is just visualizing in a different way the, the, um, you know, the 1D representation. So we are just stacking in, in a 2D kind of uh, uh, matrix and visualizing this matrix. But then we see something, so we see, it's kind of expected. Now, we see something weird, right? So we, we see this in the center, which is like a, they're like kind of shuffled. So what this what could this be? So if we zoom in and then do again the same 1D representation, so we see this pattern. So this, the so the sensors each sensor goes down, but they are kind of shuffled. Um, I don't know how you guys remember in Spain, we had you know many years ago. This is from maybe uh, in the 90s. We have um, pay TV like Canal Plus, right? And it was scrambled, right? So you have to have your uh, decoder to be able to see it. And uh, back then I was in the university and uh, with a few friends, we built a decoder for this. So, you know, we kind of cracked the, uh, the algorithm and the way in which we cracked the algorithm was not using cryptography, although that was one of my passions back then, was really by exploiting correlation between the images, and because a natural image has a correlation, you could basically, uh, if, 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 if people are just reshuffling the image, you could find the reordering that maximizes the correlation between lines. So it's very simple uh, to this. So this is what I, uh, you know, what we did, which is find the shuffling angle. I don't think that this was intentional, and this is not really an encryption but the same principle applies. Um, I think it's just that the angles, the way in which are mounted, the, 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 way, the way in which in with the uh, lasers are mounted, they are sifted because they have to be close to each other. So they may need to have uh, uh, you know, some you know, arrangement so that they fit in a small space. So it's very, you know, you, you do a few, of co a few correlations and you can find out the reordering that, max, that maximizes correlation again, and you do some fancy NumPy shuffling, which is very simple, and then you know you can rearrange, right? So this is now, if if I basically shift every line in the right way, you know we get 
this now. Um, so at least we can see that it's very gradual. And you know, every the, the angle, the uh, azimuth angle between one lidar and the other lidar, uh, you know, is, is almost the same. So you know, we've arranged this in a nice way. Now the question is: so this is the original one, as we are given it from the in the competition from the sensor, and this is the real one. Now, here in this case, I'm plotting the distance, right? So I have it realigned, and what I'm plotting here is the distance. Now, you can see that uh, in the colors, so the, 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 the yellow is closer to you, of course. The floor, you know, is closer to you, and as, as you know, you are measuring the distance, in, you know, in the, in the sky, so you see darker blue, so it's farther away, right? And there are some blocks that you can see. There are some blobs there. You see those, those things? There are like at least three and, and partially one of them occluded on the side that are closer or farther. Um, and this is the grand truth. So this is really. So it's, now it's a much, much easier way of you know, dealing with this problem. So in the top image, you have the rearranged, reshuffled, um, LiDAR uh, measurements in a dense, almost dense matrix. There's holes. We'll see what those holes really mean. And on the bottom, we see the ground truth. And you can almost tell visually that there's, you know, that there's high, even obvious correlation, which is great. I think it's even easier to see uh, LiDAR in this way than to see it in these very sparse you know, point clouds that are really, really sparse. So this is a super dense matrix. So um, now, what are those um, black points? So the black points are really where the, the measure, the, the, the sensor uh, measure almost zero. And uh, it may be because you, know, you are spinning the lighter and there's like nothing, right? And then the sensor may time out, and then it spits a zero, right? That's, that's what we think. Um, and then, um, so basically, we took every point that had a very small distance, and we put it in, a, in a, as a dark uh, point. And then we'll see how we handle this in the deep learning model. Now, because it's the equivalent as if you have some image with noise, like with points that you don't know really what they, what they are. But there's a solution that you, can, that you can come up with. Now, if instead of plotting the um, asymod, which we've already did, we plot the zenith angle, uh, now, there's something weird going on. We would expect that because we have a discrete amount of lasers, we have 32 lasers. Why? You know, why? So we see those spikes, which look cool. There's, there's a, a more lasers closer to zero because typically there are more objects you know, that are you know, in your line of view. Um, but then why you know, we, we see this like uh, uh, almost uh, noisy uh, scenic measurements? And if you... Yeah, so, so if you look at this image, there's something funny going on in this image. So you can see that um, there's a discontinuity right there, right? So what could this be, right? Because obviously there's no, it, it is not, you know, a glitch in the matrix, like in the movie. There's something going on. There's, there must be a physical reason why uh, there's a discontinuity. And the reason is because the car is moving. Right, so if you, you know, if you pretend that you slow time, and then you see the car moving, so the rotational speed of the lidar is in comparison, you know, r relative to the ca car moving. So when you start measuring, you know, distance you're moving, and then when you almost going back, the car is in a different place. So they are changing, uh, in this way, the frame of reference, right? And the lidar is not accounting for that. Um, and actually, you can see that um, the, it's fun, the, way, the way in which with the LiDAR, with this LiDAR at least, you can measure the movement is because um, the top of the car, which is static relative to the car, is the only thing that is static, right? The top of the car uh, versus the environment is encoded. So we can derive movement of the car using the top. And then you can re-reference the whole thing with the top of the car. And when you re-reference, you change your, your uh, reference system uh, to, to one point in which you start taking measurements. Uh, then, boom, you get discrete 
the discrete angles, which were uh, what we were looking uh, in the first place. So, um, so this looks pretty good. So at this point, what do we have? So we have, so if we reshuffle the stuff, so we have the distance, you know, and we can, you can, we can already see stuff, right? So this is really, you really have to think about, you have this in, in uh, this goes like a circle, right? So though we are seeing just the front, this is from minus pi to pi, or from minus 180 to 180. You have the intensity, and then you have also, you know, optionally, you have the SMO angle. If we, if we think that there could be some correlation, because let's say that typically, right, cars are in your line of sight. There's hopefully, remember that these things work on uh, correlations. Um, and, um, you know, we can uh, assume that there's more cars, you know, maybe on this angle and on this one than on the sides, maybe. On crossroads, you may see cars on the side, but not so often. Same with pedestrians, right? Pedestrians should be in these areas, and hopefully there's no pedestrians, you know, that you are about to, uh, to kill, right? And just in front of you. So, but, you know, we'll see what we do. But at least now, so now what we've done so far is we've come with a completely different representation of the later data that if you've worked with uh, three, three with deep learning models, this almost looks now like a very, very easy problem. Now, hold on, because um, the issue here is you have to enter all these things that we've uh, mentioned. So we, uh, we add the four things, the distance, intensity, azimuth, and then um, the, uh, we'll see why we enter the, the ring coordinates and also the fake points. And at the end, you have to get a semantic segmentation. Uh, label of every valid 3D point, right? So this looks, you know, very, very similar. Uh, so we use the workhorse, workhorse of uh, segmentation problems in deep learning, which is called a UNET. So a UNET is a very popular architecture for segmentation problems. Now the issue with a UNET, like with the canonical UNET, is that there's a few issues. One is that it does the um, the uh, max pooling, if you are familiar with the unit, you see that the convolutions, they take a map of convolutions, and then you gradually reduce them, and you get like a latent space at the bottom, and then you reconstruct again with upscaling uh, convolutions or interpolations, so you can use the convolutions or transpose convolutions um, or interpolation, it doesn't really matter in this case too much. But if you think about it in a regular unit, in a unit you do it in, in the two axes, right, in X and Y. Now, in our case, this is tricky because, yeah, the X axis looks that we can squeeze, right? But the Y axis is really the um, LIDAR, um, LIDAR angles. So there's no really, in the same way in which in an image we have like a trans translational invariance in an image, in this case, we have only uh, translation and invariance in one direction, in the, in the x direction, in the azimuth directions. We do not have um, translation and invariance in the uh, zenith directions because uh, this is like a different, um, this is a different um, laser, and a car doesn't look the same here than in the very far. Uh, not only it looks smaller. Uh, in the, in the um, you know, when, when it's far away, but it's also typically it's being shown in different LiDAR uh, lasers. So, uh, but anyway, this is the architecture based on a unit. It has roughly uh, 10 million parameters with a special uh, dropout to uh, increase generalization. And we did some ablation analysis that basically ablation is a, a very boring task of, you know, uh, running the same experiment, taking out stuff, right, and measuring the relative impact uh, improvement or uh, worsening of your performance if you take, give or take uh, some characteristics. And we found that when we, um, you know, when we, you know, added or removed the azimuth angle, it really dis didn't change too much. So, not, not, you know, not surprising. But uh, anyway, we also tried many different things. In these competitions, you know, it's, it's not that you have, of course you have to have a good idea and be able to implement it, but it's critical that you are able to try experiments really, really, really fast. 
Um, those of you who've done deep learning should know that deep learning is really a very empiric discipline, right? Although you see equations and everything looks like fixed in stone, it's really not the case and you need to run experiments and see really, you know, you may have like an intuition of what may work better than other things, but it's really about having a pipeline that you can test very, very quickly. And the speed is critical on these competitions. Uh, models take long to train, so you have to balance between, you know, complexity of your architecture, number of experiments you run, etc. That's critical. I cannot emphasize this enough. So um, now there's a few things. The most important thing is what I already mentioned, that there's uh, translational invariance in this direction, but there's no translational invariance in this direction. Right? There's two ways you can deal with this problem. The most elegant way, but we didn't do because, again, this is uh, finding a shortcut to do quickly, is to build a new type of convolution that has uh, shared weights in one direction, but not in the other. That is, in, in PyTorch, this is very, very, well, well, no, it's not very easy, but it's doable relatively easily um, because they give you some low-level primitive to build your own convolutions. In TensorFlow, it's a bit more convoluted. Um, so we began this competition, we use um, TensorFlow and Keras, so we basically did a shortcut which is super quick, which is just adding an extra channel that basically tells the a regular convolution architecture where it is in the image, in the image, which is really a dense matrix, right? So, so if you think about it in an image, in a in a convolution, the um, what a neuron at the end sees, it doesn't really know where it is, where, right? Because it has shared ways all across the image. But in this case, it's critical to know where it is, in which, at least in which laser it is. And the way in which we do it is we just add a new channel, which just telling um, in every line the you know, number meters mi between minus one and one, something that basically tells the convolution weights you know, where they are, and they can learn a combination of this number plus the actual contents of the image. So it can learn from the positional uh, location. So and then, so this is um, you know one one trick. Um, actually, Uber did a pretty good paper on this trick. Uh, and then we also we have this issue with uh, with uh, images that are different. Uh, you know, remember I said the different different number of points. So it looks they have different number of uh, width in this. So there's two ways you can basically do one net that in one shot gives you all the predictions or We'll see why later. You can split the 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 whole frame into you know uh, small segments with some overlap. Run in, run training or inference in all of them, and then reconstruct. And then you get, with this you can do TTA, which is uh, test time test time augmentation, and you can do kind of a you know runtime ensemble. Uh, and and you know incredibly, this architecture is super fast, and we were able to do. Um, um, you know, augmentation in real time, in real time, and the, still being within the limits of the competition uh, requirements. So, um, how we optimize the model? Nothing really fancy, uh, really. I think the we just did a validation split of 10% uh, of, of the of the images. Um, we to regularize this, we did dropout, and then we did flips and. Some small alignment per, uh, uh, per, uh, perturbation, some adding Gaussian noise. And then for, a, for the optimizer, we didn't do anything fancy, just Adam, that's it. Maybe today we will use one cycle, which is, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, it's newer, it's the cool new on the, the, the new kid on the block. And then I think the important thing is here um, for uh, the loss function, we use, um, remember this uh, intersection over union? metric that we are given is not differentiable. Uh, so we cannot use it directly as a loss function. There are two ways. We use a very new loss function called LOVAST, which is a very sophisticated mathematical function that is a good proxy of IOU, but surprisingly didn't, uh, didn't really uh, get us much better performance, and it was much slower. Uh, so we did a mix of um, cross entropy class, a softened version of the IOU, which you know 
uh, it's very easy to basically soft, you know, make a, a soft version of the hard IRU, and then also the same with uh, soft uh, dice coefficient. So there's actually, there's a loss called the Chabersky loss, okay. something that is named after a Russian guy, the math are good, right? That's guaranteed. Um, so this is a, a Chabersky loss, it's a generalization of the F1, F2, uh, IOU and dice. Um, and then you can, with this formula, you can basically soften it and, 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 and uh, do cool stuff with it. And then um, for those fake points that we see, we basically void the loss function. So then that's how we take care of those like, fake points that are you know, kind of a nightmare. Um, and then we train for uh, 100 epochs, but not much. Uh, looks a lot, but it was relatively quick to train. Maybe it took one day, not much, for the whole thing. Uh, which, you know, incredibly, it's given where we are today with deep learning, that some models take weeks, uh, this is pretty good. And then um, uh, in terms of performance, so this competition, well, this competition was crazy because we had like a different, we didn't even know the rules um, because they were in Chinese and they kept changing everything. Uh, but but in, any, in, in every part of the um, stage of the competition, which we really didn't understand, we are scored um, on top and significantly better than the rest of the teams. I think this is why, because what I said, we did something very, very difficult and very native to the sensor without losing an inch, literally an inch of accuracy of the sensor. So um, the winning submission had a, a runtime inference of uh, 65 sec uh, milliseconds, well below the limit of 100. So. And this is with four TDI overlaps, so pretty good. Even we tested with no overlaps, and we will still have one with just 20 milliseconds. So this means that these guys could have better LIDARs, and the deep learning model will not be uh, the bottleneck. Actually, it's funny, because uh, once we were in the actual um, competition, the Alibaba guys, uh, told us that they tried something similar, but they couldn't make it work. So um, again, so what I said is you have to do something different, but do something right. I think they made a mistake somewhere, and then they thought this wouldn't work, but it did, if you do everything you know, carefully. Then um, you know, once you train a model and you want to optimize it for inference, you know, because we were, this was very, very fast already, the only thing we did is a you know, trick that is very easy. You know that you, to, to train deep learning architectures, typically you use batch normalization, right? To help you with you know, the vanishing gradients because of the stats of the activations. Now, if you think about what is really batch normalization, it's really <laughs> everything in deep learning is multiplications and additions. <laughs> everything, right? Uh, don't let people fool you. This is just multiplications and additions. Uh, so, what is a convolution? It's the same, right? It's a multiplication addition. So you can actually, once the model is trained, you can actually mix the two of them. So you can get rid of the batch normalization, those, those additions and so take the bias and weights, and then shift them to the convolutional weights. Very easy. And then you remove many layers. Performance. And, um, and that's it. That's a... Uh, I would say that the summary is that we created a very novel representation of um, a LiDAR sensor. And then we, um, of course, once we have this in a dense-like matrix, we could leverage existing segmentation architectures with a few caveats and tricks. And then um, in every part of the competition, we scored much better. And to our surprise, not only we got the objective price of the competition, but then the organizers. So this happened to be, so this I didn't know. When, when I joined, I thought that this was just an online competition. And because everything was in Chinese, this happened to be one of the biggest, like a conference about deep learning in China, with lots of people in, a, in China, physically, in a, in, a, in a city in China. And we got the, um, also an extra prize for the most innovative solution of the whole you know, competition. We have many different tracks for other uh, tasks. And that's it.
one, two. Andres, well, that's fascinating um, that you be beat so many people without really knowing what the hell was going on. So very, very impressive. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, did you say what you won, what the prize was, or is it secret? Well, the British Chinese. money, yeah. Okay, well, Chinese citizenship, or no? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I wanted this prize. <laughs> uh, you don't have to reveal yeah. the money. No, well, it's it's uh, it's public in the competition rules. So it was money in uh, in yuan. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Good exchange rate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Any questions out there for Andres about this uh, this experience of incredible story? Okay, I don't see any. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Is that Jesse up there, I see? Maybe, maybe not. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, we have a question here in the middle. Fatima is heading towards you. Keep your hand up. Hello. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess that uh, you didn't uh, go to this uh, solution at the first time. So I, I would like to know uh, how much time did you spend to achieve <laughs> all of this? So it's funny, I always get this question, like how much time you get. So um, actually not much coding. So the way it typically goes for me is on this, so I've done many competitions. Um, and typically like uh, I'm given the problem and then I don't do anything. I spend like a few days thinking about it. And then I guess the moment in which I knew that we had a great representation, maybe only took one day. Once you know, I did the exploration, because I have a background in electronics, so I was, I, I guess, like the hidden secret I was going to, 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 I was seeking for, and actually found, was how would I send the data of the LiDAR sensor if I was a firmware engineer, right? And I thought to myself how I would do it in packets, et cetera, and then try to then, but this could have not worked, right? But it did in the first try. Um, so that's, that's the, um, I guess, the, the, the answer, which may not be very, um, you know, may be a bit surprising, but I, I guess it, we were a bit, we had a bit of luck in that regard. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Here we have one right up. Going to make you work, Fatima. You have to come down to the front now. Just if you keep your hand held up so Fatima can see you. Just down here in the front. So I would like to ask you, because I know that you have been engaged in many other competitions since this one. And I know that you have evolved a lot, um, even if this is fascinating, the way that you have envisioned the representation of data to be uh, embedded in the, in the model. Uh, would you, uh, now that you, uh, with all the experience that you have with other competitions, uh, what would you have changed if you will approach this, so this problem now? in the data representation, this is one question, and the other question in model architecture. Would you have changed something? Well, um, I guess the, so the answer is in the data representation, I don't think I would change anything. And I also made a recommendation to the hardware community to send the data uh, in this way, because there is very, very complex substandard, in my view, architectures to deal with point clouds, right? And a point cloud is really like a set of points in, in let's say, 3D space. Now, but a LiDAR, although it's, it is a point cloud, it has less entropy than you know, many arbitrary point clouds. For example, it's impossible to have a point if you're shooting in this direction. It's impossible physically to have a point here and a point you know, beneath the point, right? Because it reflects. Right? So there's entropy, so there's a you know, precondition. Right? This data representation is the native data representation. So I guess um, maybe if this was like an image competition, like a pure image, then I would give you a better answer. Although people in, in deep learning architectures would used to feed RGB channels, 
Um, you could also feed uh, in JPEGs, for example, there's luminance and chrominance, and they're subsampled. Why don't you feed luminance and chrominance? But in this slider, I wouldn't deal with that. Now, what would I be doing differently? You know, if I wanted to further improve this, one would be the validation. So the validation we did, uh, random percentage. We did a quick test to, because we were given the, the images like shuffled, like the images, the frame shuffled, but we were able to, using correlations, uh, reorder them and build videos of the cars. And, and so, of course, if you do this, then you can build a better validation model that basically uh, doesn't have any overlap with other videos, right? So this, this, this will be one difference. And in terms of model architecture, there's many new things coming in segmentation architectures. There's a pyramid network, et cetera. So, you know, I will use, you know, the coolest new thing, uh, which there are a few. They give you tiny percentages. So with that alone, you may not be able to win. Now, we will improve a bit, but not winning. Just with that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a fascinating story. And thank you to Andres. And congratulations once again. Thank you. Well, muchas gracias.